you have your Bible with you, please turn to 2 Corinthians and chapter 13 this evening. 2 Corinthians and chapter 13. Thank you, Arthur, for leading us so helpfully again tonight. Thank you. What do we wish for Andrew and Vivian as they depart? What do we wish for Andrew and Vivian as they depart? What should we be praying for? What should we desire for them as they leave these shores and return to miserable sunny Spain? (laughs) Well, I think there are two ways of answering that question tonight, and one would be that we could very helpfully pray about a number of practical issues and circumstances. Safety in travel that they will be reunited with their possessions, that both they and their possessions will at some point arrive at the same place, that they will have a good link-up with health services as they return, they'll find the right home, they'll settle well again with family, in church, with work, and as they set up their evangelistic fish and chip van. But, you know, good as those things are, we can do even better. And why would we not want to do the very best? What is it that we desire for them as they leave these shores? I think we could look at three types of answers this evening. We could look at certain themes from the Bible, perhaps the fruit of the Spirit, and we could pray for them and desire for them that they know more of love and joy and peace and patience, etc., Or secondly, we can look at the prayers of Scripture, not least the prayers of the Apostle Paul, who never seems to pray about circumstances. We can learn from his prayers for them. But what we're going to do tonight, thirdly, is we're going to look at Paul's benedictions. Those things which he says at the end of his letters, his heart expressions of goodwill, towards those he's writing to. When he invokes, he calls upon divine help and blessing. And when we see what he calls upon, we can see what we should be desiring above everything else for Andrew and Vivian this evening. The very, very best. Why settle for less? Please turn to the closing verses of 2 Corinthians and chapter 13, where in verse 11 we find the simple word, farewell. Farewell. And it's sadly time to say farewell to Andrew and Vivian. It doesn't seem all that long ago that we first got to hear that they were coming to Shepshed. In fact, it was Danny who pointed it out because I think it was his uncle had received a prayer letter from Andrew and Vivian. It was prayer letter number 371. It was sent on the 8th of September 2020 and it began with these words. Dear friends, the information at the head of this letter reflects the fact that we've moved. We're delighted to be able to give you our new address even though we won't be getting the keys to Stableford Close Shepshed until the 18th of September, the Lord permitting. As for our new home, we've never been to Shepshed to this very day, but a combination of internet searching, very helpful local knowledge, thank you Paul and Pat, a quick virtual viewing and a favourable decision on the part of the owners of the property, we got number, which I won't say as we're live, Stableford Close. A three-storey townhouse with a small garden. We haven't had a garden for over 40 years. It's in a fairly quiet cul-de-sac in walking distance of church, Shepshed Word of Life Church and shops and dash, wait for it, dash, a brand new fish and chip shop. (laughs) Due to open its doors today. That's quite a theme, isn't it? Fish and chips and Andrew and Vivian. Two Corinthians. 13, 11, farewell, farewell. After only three and a half years in which we've been busy and they've been busy, but we've enjoyed your presence. We've enjoyed the presence of your mature hearts and we thank you deeply. You'll see from verse 11 that there's five exhortations to the church at Corinth. 
become complete. There's still a work to be done. Be of good comfort. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And then verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. Five exhortations. There's a promise. Verse 11, the God of love and peace will be with you. And there's a statement of fact. All the saints greet you. But that just clears the way for the final verse, the closing benediction with which we are all very familiar. And we're going to look at this benediction this evening, and it's to inform what we wish for you. Us too. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. First thing I want to mention fairly briefly, just to heighten the significance of what Paul says here, is this. Imagine a pastor, and I'm not talking of Andrew now, imagine a pastor coming to join Shepshed Word of Life Church after a difficult experience. A ministry of trial, a ministry of hardship, a ministry in which he's been cast down, imprisoned, beaten, sleepless nights. But nevertheless, a ministry of courage, entering a place in weakness, fear and trembling to declare the unsearchable riches of our Lord Jesus Christ. And seeing a people converted, but then in many ways being a huge disappointment. And not many years later, making scandalous accusations against you. Imagine a, a pastor having been through that and, and joining us. And we recognize that in him and his previous ministry, there's been devoted love, self-sacrifice, and much grace. And of course, that's relevant because that's very much Paul, Pastor Paul, and his history with the Corinthian church. He founded this church. He went into this very immoral seaport full of pagans. He went in fear and trembling and he preached Christ and a church was born. And a pointed summary really tonight in the context is that these people have actually given him much grief. Some of them have remained immoral False teachers have infiltrated the church and rejected his previous exhortations to them. Many in the church have begun to vilify Paul. Many folk there are his fruit, but they've come to doubt and question his ministry and even his conversion. And they've been very cruel to him. Relationships are strained. They feel let down. He hadn't come when he said that he would like to have come. And to them, that made him out to be a shallow, duplicitous man. He deceived and intimidated the church. He defrauded and mistreated people. So the accusations went. And so when he writes to them, there's a tone of sorrow and severity. There's a very agitated and stormy atmosphere about Paul's letter. He has to defend himself and appeal for factions to reconcile. Satan has been at work in the church. It's generally regarded as the most difficult letter that Paul had to write. He's dealing with difficult people. And so in the letter, he explains why he's been delayed. He expresses his joy that the moral problem in the church has been sorted out. He talks about the collection for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. He talks about the so-called super apostles compared to him. And he has to defend his character in the face of much slander. And in the face of all of that, he urges his people to lead holy lives, to repent and to be reconciled to one another, before he then ends with these very famous words. It's against that background that Paul, with a pastoral heart, ends his farewell with verse 14. 
And so from the context, we're going to look at the content this evening. You see, verse 14 is not a vacuous add-on. Paul hasn't gone to a file of his benedictions and cut and paste one and just stuck it on the end of his letter to the Corinthians. No, no, verse 14 brings everything he said to them together. The expression of his heart for them is that they might know these three things. As a priority, above everything else, it's going to be what they most need and it's what he most desires for them. And so he says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Notice he doesn't say forevermore. (laughs) We tend to, don't we? He doesn't. You see, it's a concluding benediction, isn't it? Invoking blessing, calling upon God to richly bless these people. The blessing that Paul invokes is the blessing of no one less than God. The blessing he invokes is the blessing of no one less than the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God, though it's an unusual order here, isn't it? It's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's Son, Father, and Holy Spirit. And he says three things. They must be the remedy, surely, for what these people are going through. They're his priority. They're the things that they most need. And therefore, these should be the things which we most pray about for Andrew and Vivian and for ourselves. These are the crucial things, friends, that we cannot do without. And if we are to live as a supernatural people in Christ and with him in us, this is our daily bread and butter, hour by hour. Number one, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He has to centre it on Christ, doesn't he? To Paul, Christ is genuinely his all in all. In his letters, he's described into the Corinthians as our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. You know what you guys most need at Corinth? is something to do with our Lord Jesus Christ. Him who loved us and gave himself for us. He upon whose hands are written our names. What you need to know is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, a full title here. The grace, well, that means, of course, his undeserved favour, isn't it? What this group of Christians need more than anything else is the undeserved kindness and the unmerited favour of God ruling and reigning every moment of their lives. It's this amazing grace of which we sing that taught our hearts to fear, this grace which has led us safe as far, this grace which will lead us home. It's grace, friends, isn't it, from start to finish, as we saw last Sunday night, was it? It's not of merit. It's wholly of his mercy and his grace. Oh, how the grace of God truly, after all of these years, still amazes me. His amazing grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches to us, at Christ's expense, Christ crucified, that we would know this vital and foundational disposition of God. He's a God of grace. That's his attitude. Fascinating, isn't it, that in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, we find there the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who is rich beyond all splendour, all for love's sake became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're a Christian tonight, if we're standing in Christ with sins forgiven, then we know it is by grace that we have been saved and not by works. And I'm sure, if I can be, that that's why Paul starts with Jesus. He starts with his people who now knowingly have been saved. They know God. 
savingly. This is how they've come to know Father, Son and Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And it's all of grace. But I don't think that's the main thing Paul means here. I don't think it's that disposition of God, that attitude of God, that quality of mind in God, glorious though that is. It's another aspect of grace which I sometimes fear we don't grasp. It's God's enabling grace at work in us today. God's grace is not only the grounds of everything in the Christian life. God's grace empowers everything in the Christian life. It's not just a a disposition looking kindly at us from a distance. It's a work being done in us. And you can see that from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 now. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You're going to be able to abound in every good work at all times, in all things. You have all sufficiency by the ongoing enabling grace of God. He hasn't just left you and wound you up at the start of your Christian life and he'll see you at the end. His enabling grace is at work in us each and every day. I'm sure that the grace that Paul is speaking of here is more than a disposition. It pictures grace as a power or an influence at work within, today. Enabling obedience, enabling endurance, enabling Christ-likeness. It's not what we work up. It's what he works in and then we work out. Another example from the same letter. Paul's got his thorn in the flesh, hasn't he? And Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It's not my disposition from on far that's sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. It's as you face this thorn of flesh today, Paul, my enabling grace today is sufficient for you. Grace is not only a disposition or quality or inclination in the nature of God. It's an influence or a force or a power or, and it truly is, an acting of God that works in us to change our capacities for work and endurance and suffering and to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Do you get that? Paul's not only referring to God's character trait or an inclination to treat people better than we deserve. He's referring to an ongoing action or power or influence of the force of that disposition which produces real, practical outcomes in people's lives. Like being sufficient for good deeds or enduring the thorn in the flesh or working harder than everybody else. That's what Paul says, but he does that by the grace of God. Friends, this is the enabling, undeserved power of Jesus at work. And I want you please to note that's his first priority, his first concern. What what these guys need more than anything else It's the enabling grace now. Now they've been saved by grace. It's the enabling grace. The fountain, the Niagara Falls of grace that floods every day upon them. That they be drenched in this grace each and every day, enabling them to do more than live a religious life which accepts truth as a philosophy and learns a pattern of behaviour. but lives in the Spirit. 
by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, grace is God freely providing for us, as we trust in the work of his Son, all that we ever need, all that we ever yearn for, all that he's commanded us to walk in and to become. It's he who supplies the grace. Those things I've just listed are realities that could never be produced on our own. We can never earn them, never deserve them, never work them up. Grace offers what every human desperately needs, but what God alone can provide. And it's given. And really, it's the giving of himself. God working in us, that strength, enabling Christians to function in the capacity of the Spirit. The enabling grace of God is a supernatural supply of strength from God to power true living Christian living. And Paul says, you need it. Oh, may it be yours. But as I'm asking for it, you should ask for it too. Andrew and Vivian, we desire the very best for you. And the very best surely is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ being with you. Every day, every hour, every task, every setback, every joy, every sorrow, every anxiety, every fish and chip meal. The grace the enabling grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, Paul says, and the love of God, speaking surely here of the Father. And surely this love of the Father cannot be known outside of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We only come truly to know the love of the Father when we're in Christ, as near to God as the Son is. Paul writes about God's love for us in verse 11. He gives four exhortations and then says, and the God of love and peace will be with you. What does he mean by that? Well, as we find elsewhere with Paul regularly, he desires them to be conscious of and assured of God's love. He wants them to know at three o'clock on a Monday afternoon at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night. He wants them to know every minute of the day in their hearts, not just their minds, in a tick box. He wants them to know that God loves them. He wants them to have an assurance of God's love, the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts by God the Holy Spirit of which John speaks, and Paul speaks, and Matthew speaks, and Mark speaks, and Luke speaks, and Peter speaks, and Jude speaks. It seems to me here that this is very much a parallel concern with what we see in that great prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that you will be strengthened in your inner being by God the Holy Spirit that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, that you would be given power together with all the saints to grasp the height, depth, length and breadth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and to know this love which surpasses knowledge being filled to the fullness of God. Fascinating that, isn't it? Being filled to the fullness of God, maturity... It's about knowing how much God loves you. It's about knowing how much God loves you. And there's a parallel, isn't there? You know, I pray that you be strengthened by the Spirit, Christ dwell in your hearts, here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. I'm still struck by Stuart Olliott's phrase, who He's concerned that for most evangelical Christians today, the Lord Jesus Christ is not very real 
to them in their daily lives. How many of us know that we ought to know that we are loved, and we do know that we're loved, but we, we don't feel it, meditate upon it, doesn't propel us through every day, don't get up in the morning and firstly aware of how much this great God loves us. He wants these Christians to really know how much they're loved of God. That love which was demonstrated in the cross that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That this holy and majestic and just and all the things Arthur prayed earlier on, omnipotent, omniscient God is also a God who is love. A God who therefore works, desires and works for the good of others. That's what love is. Love can only be known from the actions that it prompts. And this holy God who's a God of love desires and works for the good of others. But in his case, those others, oh dear, by nature they're a pretty gruesome lot. They're undeserving. They haven't loved him. The best of their deeds is as a menstrual rag in his sight. And will never reach above that in and of themselves. And yet he desires and works for their good. And their good involves giving to them the complete forgiveness of their sins, eternal life, reconciliation with God, Adopted into his family, clothed in perfect righteousness. You can't think of anything you've missed out, can you? Love wants the best. That's what this God of love wants and gives to this lot. <laughs> and it involves two things. It involves God becoming flesh. Sapphire paved courts for its stable floor. God became flesh. And lies in an animal feeding trough in Bethlehem. And then goes to another kit of wood, which is a cross at Calvary, to be made sin and a curse for this lot that they might know these things forever. That they'd be his bride with whom he will be in intimate communion forever and for ever. And what Paul wants here for them is that habitual sense of God's love as it's given to them by God the Holy Spirit. And as we touched on last week, that really means us owning our depravity and then basking in his love. Please go and bask in his love this week. Just get up in the morning and bask in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father sent the Saviour, the Son, to be the Saviour of the world. Vivian Andrew, we trust that you'll know the enabling grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe as you, even you have never known before something more of just how much he loves you. It's a crying need amongst us to know how awful we are by nature and how truly, really, we are loved every moment of every day. And thirdly, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion could be communication, could be communion, could be fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an illustration, which I thought Mike was going to give this morning at one point. <laughs> Imagine you're away from home, but you know that a distant one loves you. 
Maybe that's what Wilf knows today on his birthday. Maybe that's what his parents and family know as they're separated. You know that a distant one loves you, and that's great. That's really comforting. But then a letter arrives in their handwriting. That's a different ball game. They've written. It's their words. They've taken the time. It's great to know that a distance they love me, but it's just gone up a notch or two. Got the letter. And then there's a knock at the door. Surprise, surprise. They arrive. And there's arms of embrace and a kiss. And we've gone up another notch or two, haven't we? From knowing that somebody loves us at a distance to knowing they've communicated to us to knowing fellowship with them. This love is communicated by the Spirit. We are by the Spirit to enjoy the company of God. Not just in the times when we meet together as Christians on a Sunday or midweek. Not just in our quiet times. We're to enjoy the company of God throughout the day. We're dead to sin. We're alive to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. His Spirit dwells within us. And that enabling grace enables us to enjoy the company of God through the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and through fellowship with him. Some say their prayers, don't they? And others seem to pray until they pray. You've probably been in both camps. Some read their Bible almost as a lucky charm and superstition. Others read until the words embrace them, and it's as though the Saviour himself comes to meet them from the page. Some listen to preaching because they just happen to be there when somebody's preaching. Others come with prepared hearts, longing and thirsting. And sometimes we know God really speaking to us, with us, dealing with us, embracing us, and we embrace him. Some come to the Lord's table because that's what we do twice a month. Others come and they know the Saviour unveiling himself to them. There are moments. It happens from time to time. But it's not just an abstract occasional notion that he loves us. And not even to be some mere occasional heightened enjoyment of that reality, communication can become communion when two become one. And abiding in Christ by the Spirit, knowing his settled company with us. Our lives take on a different spirit because of the communion of the Holy Spirit. And then there's sometimes what Paul says, as he does at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, that fellowship of the Spirit, that consciousness we have of an indwelling presence and a dialogue and a burning heart, because the Spirit has united us to Christ and with one another, and this real intimacy at a level not experienced even in human relationships. The fellowship of God the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, may that be with a little spiritual elite in the church. No, he doesn't. He says, be with you all. Not a few comforted by this and enjoying it. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you're ever again 
a bit stuck with what to pray for somebody. There's always a Lord's Prayer. There's always Paul's prayers, but there's always the grace. What blessings they are. Oh, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you all. And many have commentated that when we start to pray it for each other, we find that we ourselves increasingly have it. We look briefly at the context. Paul's writing to this difficult, dysfunctional group of believers. He's invoking a threefold blessing upon them and we close by just looking at the lessons from it. You see, from verse 5 in this final chapter, he's been talking about three things. Assurance that we are a Christian. Examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith. Examine, because it's possible to know that you are in the faith. I trust that you will know, he says. Have a thorough good look. You can know. There are three marks, John says. Faith in Christ. I mean, when we pray, we expect to be heard by God, not because of our words, but because Christ died for our sins. It's not about our sincerity or our religion. It's faith in the Lord Jesus. It's because we love other Christians, have the same faith, the same Lord, the same experience of salvation. There's a oneness that perhaps doesn't even go out to family members in the blood family. We love one another. The second test. And thirdly, that we love God's laws. We don't keep them perfectly, but we want to. We attempt to. We never manage it. But we can say with Paul, I delight after the law of God in my inner being. I do love his instructions. I do wish I could put them into practice. I do wish that I wish this all the time, because I know that I don't always wish this. He wants them to know, first of all, that they are Christians. He wants them deep down to know that they've been saved by grace. That assurance. But then he goes on, verse 7 to 10, about growth, that they be made complete. The word used of a, a net that needs mending. He prays that the church will get sorted, that they'll be assured of their faith and that they'll grow. His gifts have been given, verse 10, for edification. I want these guys to be assured that they're the Lord's, and then I want them to grow. And then lastly, verses 11 to 13, it's about them being complete in their fellowship one with another. Be of good comfort. Be an encouragement one to another. Be of one mind. Think the same thoughts. Live in peace. So as he comes to the end of this letter, desiring assurance for them and growth and maturity for them and real loving fellowship amongst them... He says, do you know what the real remedy and solution is for those things? It's more than knowing a set of truth and learning a pattern of behaviour. It's knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself to empower you to live righteously, to reconcile you to one another, to love and encourage each other instead of fighting. I love you guys, he's effectively saying to them here, and about everything you else, you need not the selfishness and immaturity that mark you, but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the anger that you have in your hearts, but the love of God. Not the conflict that there is, but the communion of the Holy Spirit. Paul is dead clear what he wants for these people and why. It's their greatest need if they are to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ 24-7. And sometimes we are very clear, aren't we, what we want for ourselves and for our family or for our friends. But friends, this is the best. This is what we are to want for one another. And Andrew and Vivian, it's what we want for you. 
And I'm sure it's what you want for yourselves, and I'm equally sure it's what you want for us. And friends, it's what we're to want for one another. And if a church laid a hold of this, calling upon God for this in fervent prayer, would not God answer? And might our daily experience go up several notches? Because we set our heart on the things that Paul wanted for people. Andrew and Vivian, may you have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the love of God be yours. May the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours. May you have it. All free in this blessing. And may we all of us have it as we call upon God to give it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. We're going to stand if we're able to sing first of all.